The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tom Heron, and I'm involved in market transformation at NFRC. And that, of course, really means working to make the adoption of energy efficiency technologies and best practices the standard in green building. And as part of our Emerging Technology and Sustainability series, we have a very exciting webinar for you today. It, of course, is entitled The Quality Systems Approach to Building Performance in Commercial Glazing. And this is going to help us understand how a system approach that uses industry best practices can improve glazing projects and outcomes. One of our speakers is Jeff DeLaba. Uh, Jeff and I were just talking about how we met at the American Institute of Architects show uh, a couple of months ago, and he's the program development director for the Architectural Glass and Metal Certification Council. Jeff's been involved in glazing certification and best practices for about 28 years and was recognized by the publication U.S. Glass in 2021 as one of the glass and metal industry's most influential people. So thank you for being here, Jeff. We're glad to have you. Our second speaker is Dana Landis, and she is a building enclosure consultant with Wiss Janney Elsner Associates, and her work includes building enclosure commissioning, peer review services, and facade assessments. Dana is also a certified simulator. We're so glad to have you join us today. Before we officially get started, Michelle Blackston, who is involved in development and engagement at NFRC, is going to offer us a few words about how our sponsors, in part, help make this kind of educational content possible. Hi. Uh, I turned my camera on, but why isn't it showing up? Um, let's see. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. Maybe now it's coming on. Okay, anyway, the, um, trying to turn my webcam on and it's not turning on. But anyway, this is uh, Michelle Blackston, like Tom said, and I'm the uh, Senior Director of Development Engagement. And I wanted to say a big thank you to our 2023 sponsors. That includes uh, our gold sponsor, Vitro Architectural Glass, our two silver sponsors, Cornerstone Building Brands and Trimco, and our three bronze sponsors, Veritas Solutions, Thermoplast Extrusions, and Quantix. And I wanted to just briefly tell you why sponsorship is so important for our success. So with support from our sponsors over the last two years, we've been able to grow the Efficient Windows Collaborative. We have more than 5,000 visitors to efficientwindows.org each month. We have more than 2,000 users of the window selection tool. Um, in fact, homeowners are going in the window selection tool and they're searching for the most energy efficient window and then they're saving their searches having it sent to their inbox and that information includes where to get those windows so it includes manufacturers such as yourself so we would love to have your um your organization support the efficient windows collaborative with a sponsorship if you support the mission of nfrc and ewc we would welcome you to be a sponsor if you also uh, want to have better brand recognition and stand out from um, from the other folks in the uh, product certification program and other manufacturers that list their products in the EWC. This gives you great visibility and better brand um, recognition. The benefits are tremendous. Uh, we would uh, we show your um, team your company logo, excuse me, on our website. We also show the logo on the NFRC website. We um, have press releases and social media. Uh, we write blogs about organizations. Um, our, our newsletter email goes to over 3,000 subscribers. We have a LinkedIn forum with, with over 4,000 members. So you're getting exposure in front of all of these audiences. Uh, so we would welcome uh, you to be a sponsor. And there are a range of levels that fit any budget for your organization. So if you have any questions and are interested in becoming a sponsor, please reach out to me. My email is listed there below, mblackson at nfrc.org, and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Thanks so much. Great, Michelle. Thank you for that information, and thank you to all our sponsors who made today possible. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speakers to get us started. Thank you, Tom, and uh, it's good to be here. I appreciate everybody joining this afternoon on Wednesday afternoon. 
we are uh, thrilled to be a part of uh, the series that's been put together by uh, NFRC for education, uh, especially in the, the sustainability area. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking today at uh, how commercial glazing uh, can be affected by a quality systems approach. What we mean by that is, uh, you know, what, how can we take commercial glazing and improve performance from the installer level? Um, how can we move commercial glazing using systems approaches and uh, moving past moving past some of the, the common mistakes and common errors that can happen in commercial glazing? Um, I'll start with the story. We, we, we started this uh, initiative uh, as an open industry initiative and volunteers from around the industry, uh, many manufacturers, uh, we have uh, general contractors, glazing contractors, glazers, uh, architects, specifiers uh, involved in this effort. And uh, what is it's the industry trying to improve overall for commercial glazing. And we started this in 2014 uh, and it's grown into to different stages since then. But right from the very start, what we realized quickly from visiting contractors around the construction industry, I don't wanna pick on, on just glazing contractors, but, but talking to contractors, what we would hear many times when they were talking about the construction process for commercial glazing or they talked about a particular installation they would say um, you know this installation is going to go really well because we have Doug on this installation and uh, Doug is a really great foreman and uh, can can do a great job with this so uh, we realized very quickly though that there weren't systems and processes in place that were written many much relied on a person's knowledge uh, on Doug you know making sure that he was doing it right and not having written systems and processes in place. So uh, what we've done, what we've done is we've created these programs in order to help drive the uh, industry forward and look more at quality systems approach and a general management systems approach to glazing. So some of the learning objectives that we're going to uh, hopefully cover today, uh, and and uh, you know we want to make sure that you you understand uh, what we're trying to explain here by looking at some of the performance risks that can be created by failed or faulty commercial glazing installations uh, we also want to look at we also want to look at uh, overall building performance and how uh, you know how that how that is affected by installation uh, you know manufacturers intend to create systems that perform in certain ways they go through nfrc ratings uh, simulations and so forth but if they're not installed correctly, some of that is, uh, you know, a failed effort. Uh, we'll look at how systems uh, systems approach uh, that utilizes industry identified best practices can help improve these glazing outcomes. And then we're also going to look at a few failures, uh, a few examples of failures with some pictures. Everybody always likes to see how somebody else screwed up. Um, but let's we'll take a look at some pictures and see, uh, you know, some things that could have gone better and how maybe a systems approach to this could have made a, a larger impact on the overall uh, project. So uh, we're gonna move into, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about why is glazing a focus? Uh, there's been numerous studies along the way, I think one of the most impactful because it comes from ASHRAE, uh, it's, it was published in 2008, but uh, in 2008 they identified that there were $10 billion in construction claims each year. And the interesting piece of this is more than half, 53%, were related to faulty installation. Um, about 19% were also from faulty designs and other things that went into it. But the interesting thing was, you know, looking at this, a lot of this ties to uh, the installer and how well the installer uh, handles the project and uh, does the actual installation. In the, the waterproofing manual on the next slide uh, is the waterproofing manual, the construction waterproofing manual uh, by Mo Michael Kubal talks about the 99% 1% principle. And the waterproofing manual ties a lot, if you're not familiar with it, ties a lot to building envelope, ways to keep water out, but also that ties to air. Uh, and in the manual, it talks about 99% of uh, water infiltration and of course air leaks are attributable to causes other than material or system failures. Um, with quality control and testing being instituted at man manufacturing stage, it's very infrequent that actual material failures occur. Um, so what we're looking here is, you know, how can we prevent human errors, um, especially at the at the point of installation at the work site, uh, which can cause multiple different issues uh, and can be prevented in the first place. 
I guess what we're really talking about is, you know, how do you create a qualified installation team? What does qualified actually mean? Uh, in order to provide the best possible outcome for a glazing project uh, for building envelope or any other glazing features uh, within a project, the, the general contractor has to identify uh, a subcontractor that can handle the glazing. Uh, that, and what we, hope to, what we hope to see is that that general contractor is using more than just, hey, they were the low bidder. Um, they're, looking at, they're looking at the qualifications of that, that subcontractor. The challenge is, is how do you look at that? You can look at it and say, well, they've been in business for five years, or you can look at it and say, well, they've done similar projects. But in today's day and age, is any project really similar? Um, you know, there's a lot of different applications of glazing systems. There's a lot of different uh, designs of buildings. And I think architects try to make their buildings unique. So, uh, you know, trying to identify a contractor or subcontractor for glazing can be a very difficult task. Um, and so what are verifiable qualifications and how can those be, how can those be instituted? On the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about you know this whole supply chain, and, and we hear we hear the term supply chain all the time. Uh, you know, you, you hear about industries and their supply chain, and of course, with COVID slowdowns, you hear about supply chain issues all the time. But basically, um, you know, the first step the first step in the supply chain is with the manufacturer and supplier uh, in identifying product performance. This means the testing simulations. Uh, you know, product development and so forth that goes into it, manufacturing control processes for process control in manufacturing. But then the next stage is it's handed out to somebody to install. Um, and we want to make sure that's not just anybody with a pickup truck and a chop saw to do the installation. So identifying a glazing subcontractor that has taken the extra steps to have process controls and quality management systems and written processes and procedures is a, an important next step. And then finally, um, you know, it's interesting for glazers, there's never really been a standard for glazers for training or competency. Glazers have uh, not been recognized in the same way that electricians or plumbers or HVAC technicians or welders have been identified in the past. It's been uh, kind of a mix of different training processes, whether it's on the job or formalized training processes, union apprenticeships, uh, and other ways that the glazers obtain training, but without a standard for what that level of knowledge, skills, and abilities needs to be as a benchmark, it's been difficult for the industry to identify, you know, what does make a qualified glazer and how can some how can the glazing subcontractors provide a provide a competent staff uh, of glazers that are identified to meet certain benchmarks. Through certification, we're trying to move the move the needle for that. Uh, so, but let's let's take a step let's take a step from here, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to to Dana for a moment, and let's I guess just to better understand this a little bit, we're going to talk about entire building envelope, uh, glazing systems and building envelope, and keeping the weather out, if you will. So uh, Dana's going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of the, the common failures that may occur with building envelope or some of the common challenges. So Dana, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so as a, a building and closure consultant, I am commonly helping clients and owners try to make sure that they have the best building performance that they can, especially as the, the energy codes are getting a little bit stronger and, and we have um, we, we need better performing buildings to meet the codes as well as reduce energy costs and things like that. So when we're looking at better building envelope performance, we're looking primarily at these things. We wanna to try to minimize air and moisture infiltration and make sure that the, the thermal isolation features are properly installed where they were intended to be. We wanna to adhere to solar shading and heat gain requirements. We look at the durability of insulating glass so that we have fewer defects caused by insulation issues. If the glass is more durable, it will be less likely to have issues during installation and even in service. Uh, we want to follow industry leading practices for enclosures, always looking towards the future, not just doing what's been done for the last 30 or 40 years, but incorporating new technologies and, and methods. And all of this is, is really to have better occupant comfort and health. 
one of the things that we can do early on in a project um, is to do some thermal modeling to evaluate the different glazing systems that can be used. As most of you probably know, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory has several programs that are used not only to provide an NFRC rating for their products, uh, for, for products in general, but also for condensation resistance to determine if the, the products that are selected will perform on a project by project basis uh, based on design criteria. So Therm is used to model the two-dimensional heat transfer effects and components. Window looks at total window performance when you bring all the parts and pieces together. And optics can be used when you're manipulating optical layers and calculating spectral data for things like different coatings and laminates. So what are some of the common reasons that building envelopes fail? Uh, it could start as early as during the design process. There may inherently be design flaws or things that may have been missed when the architect or the design team were, were developing their designs. Uh, we see construction defects through installation, poor workmanship or installation errors. Occasionally we see system failures um, or there could even be issues related to repair and maintenance after installation, whether that's lack of repair and maintenance or improper repair and maintenance that, that has an adverse effect on the, the building envelope systems and assemblies. And as we all know, we really want to try to avoid mistakes and issues before they happen uh, because repairs after installation are really costly and disruptive. Not only do you have to consider the, the time and, and disruption during the repairs, but sometimes it can take a long time and disassembly to really even diagnose where those issues are coming from. So you may need to get a crane on site to, to have somebody come in and start taking things apart. You may have some wait time while you order new IGUs or other materials that will be needed to, uh, to implement those repairs. And then of course you have the, the time and disruption during the repairs themselves. So I will hand it back to Jeff to talk a little bit more about quality management systems. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dana, and uh, very important points. I, I, I don't know, um, um, Robin, should we pause for any questions at this point? Are we too early in the, the presentation? Uh, we want to we want to have time for questions at the end, and certainly if you do have questions uh, at any point, we are monitoring the uh, the questions section of the the, the, uh, or the chat section of uh, the GoToMeeting controller here. So if you want to put a question in, you certainly can. Um, but uh, if there's uh, I, I don't have any questions up on the board yet, but maybe keep that in mind so that we can continue to uh, answer questions as they come up uh, through this presentation. So, sure, yes. okay. Oh, I was just going to say, sure, I think that's great. And uh, we talked about how maybe that would make the presentation a bit more interactive as we go rather than having all the questions at the end. So, that's a great idea. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll all cover a few more slides here and then um, yeah, we'll take another pause and uh, they'll give everybody time to put some questions in or, or uh, you know, raise their hand, I guess, uh, however that works. So, We've we've kind of led through a little bit of you know some of the challenges that there can be with glazing. Uh, we haven't looked at any real specific failures, but we've talked in general terms so far about um, you know why glazing is a challenge uh, in many cases for projects. Uh, not in all cases, but but why is it something that uh, you know needs to have more focus and process control and quality management systems? So. I know uh, many on this line are probably involved uh, in in uh, the man the, the uh, process of, of uh, manufacturing as well uh, as, as manufacturers and suppliers, but uh, you know and, and so quality management systems is probably not a foreign term. Uh, but I think what we need to do is is kind of dig in just a little bit so that there's a better understanding uh, for everybody involved here of what we mean by quality management systems and how we're utilizing that to impact the installation outcomes of projects. I guess starting with the, the, the basic definition, you know, quality, quality management systems is a, a big piece of the puzzle. It's kind of what holds everything else together. Um, if it's not in place, then uh, the rest of the puzzle can fall apart. And I, I think that the most important, you know, most important piece to this is that it creates a strategic direction for an organization. Um, having a quality management system, it's simply a collection of 
of uh, business processes that are written down. Uh, and that can be everything in a, a glazing contractor from the way that they estimate a project, uh, the way that they carry out a turnover to project management from the estimator, the way that uh, the estimator passes it off to shop drawings and onto the, the shop for any pre-glazing and fabrication, and the way that uh, you know, it travels out to the field. It also ties to process control or material controls and preservation as they come into the building. Uh, you, know, you receive deliveries. Are those deliveries what was ordered? Are the deliveries uh, inspected? Uh, are the deliveries uh, going to, to meet customer expectations or requirements for the project? So there's multiple pieces of this, and without diving all the way into it, uh, you know, the, it's it really comes down to how do you know that things are, are done correctly? Um, and many times I serve the story of done. Many times when uh, you, you talk to uh, the process of, of installation uh, or you talk to somebody that's, that's doing an installation or fabrication, and you say, how do you know that this is being done correctly? And the answer comes back is they've been doing this for years. And again, it ties back to that. Are the people the process? Uh, and they, they certainly are a large piece of the process and their competency and skills and knowledge is incredibly important to everything that's being done in the field. But at the same time, what controls, what written procedures, um, what checklists are being used as part of this to make sure that there are cognitive nets um, for everybody that is involved in this process of, uh, of fabrication and installation, uh, including shop and field. I guess at the end of the day, you know, experience is not experience is not uh, the only thing. It, it, it's it's a very important thing, but it's not an insurance assurance of uh, you know the, the fact that the procedure was, was done correctly. So when we say quality management systems, you know, one of the things that pops into many people's heads is, well, we need to have a quality manual. And a quality manual is an extremely important piece of this. It lays the high level groundwork for how processes and procedures. Uh, and policies are set for a company. So the quality manual is an important piece. However, a quality manual as a standalone uh, uh, sometimes ends up on the shelf collecting dust. It's something that has to be utilized and the way it's utilized is by uh, deploying it to have multiple pieces of the quality system come together in order to create an entire quality process uh, for the company. This includes things like procedures, um, standardized procedures, standardized ways of doing things. Verifications, uh, which is, is another way of saying quality checks. Um, at each step through the process, what quality checks or what quality verifications are being done? Uh, what policies are set for quality? Who's responsible for what? Is there a quality manager that's identified? Uh, and how does that quality manager interact with both the shop and the field, as well as the office to make sure that quality policies and quality processes are carried out throughout, throughout the entire uh, organization. Corrective actions and preventative actions. This is uh, you know, getting to the root cause of why something happened and making sure it doesn't happen again and making sure that it is corrected uh, when it does happen. Personal competency, customer feedback, and of course, reviewing everything on an annual basis as a minimum to make sure that uh, you know, the follow through is going through and that your quality manual, quality system is working the way it's intended to work and uh, creating creating better outcomes and more adherence to customer specifications and expectations. I'm going to just give you a quick example, you know, of what we mean by a procedure. Um, it doesn't have to be a 20-page procedure. It doesn't have to be uh, step after step after step, uh, getting down to the actual work instructions, but but setting some procedures for the organization. Uh, with document controls, as you can see here, there's a, a name for the document, assigned responsibility, uh, the objectives so that they understand why the procedures are in place, but providing steps um, that can be easily followed by staff within, within in the um, fabrication shop and in the field uh, to make sure that they are taking time to do the necessary steps and uh, the necessary processes in order to provide better outcomes uh, and, and eliminate some of these, these uh, failures that occur just because of oversights. Uh, these are all cognitive nets to keep us moving in the right direction. I think many times there's that, say, there's that quality control that's put out there and you say, well, you know, we have good quality control. 
Um, and there isn't always an understanding of, well, quality control and quality management systems go hand in hand. Quality management systems are a managerial tool. Uh, they involve the entire team. It's a proactive approach uh, to preventing defects. And it's a way from, you know, a systematic approach to make sure that you prevent defects and focus on process control so they don't happen in the first place. Quality control is a part of quality management systems, but it's really a corrective tool. Uh, when something is identified as not meeting required quality, either through checklists or through inspections, uh, it, the inspector that finds that can make steps to be reactive and correct those issues or identify them so they can be corrected by other staff. But it really many times tends to be an inspection of the final product uh, to look for uh, defects that have occurred. I think a I think uh, you know a good testament to this came from one of our certified contractors in California. In the past, we focused on quality controls at the end of the process to make sure the client specifications were met. I think this is really where you know where it it, it comes across. We spent significant resources fixing problems that could have been avoided. Now we put more emphasis on quality assurance throughout the process to prevent problems from occurring in the first place. How many of the challenges with glazing can occur and be hidden later? You know, something that's internal to a system. We're gonna look at some examples of things that happen internally to a system that if you inspect it after it was installed simply, you never see them. Uh, and so there has to be process controls, inspections, checklists that occur throughout the entire process. I'm going to be turning it back over to, to Dana here for a moment to run us through uh, some examples of some of the things that uh, we've seen in the field, she's seen in the field, um, some common errors that can occur and uh, you know create big challenges. But I don't see any questions that are up yet. Uh, I don't know if we want to go live for just a moment and see if there are any questions. Don't want to pause too long and take too much time here, but uh, Dane, I'll turn it over to you and let's uh, take a look at some examples. All right, sure. So these are some examples that most likely could have been avoided if a, a quality management system and, and processes were implemented on the projects. Uh, this first example kind of deals with adjacent construction. Uh, in this particular example, as you can see, they selected a thermally broken window assembly, which should have performed correctly in this implementation for this project. Uh, but because they had a continuous metal sill flashing installed beneath the system, and they put the system in a, a precast concrete rough opening, um, the thermal bridging completely bypassed those thermal breaks and, and they ended up having some condensation issues. Um, so selecting the, the correct or properly performing fenestration system is critical, but you also need to consider what is going to be up against and interfacing with. The amazing thing, I don't mean to interrupt you, Dan, but on this, we're, we're looking at this example with you. Um, the amazing thing is they had to build this trough on the side of it. Um, yeah, so they wanted to help control the condensation in this building uh, related to the windows. and. They really just didn't have the capability to remove and replace or, or really modify the openings too much. So we came up with a repair scheme to add an extra uh, piece of metal on the backside and kind of create a gutter so that if there's any condensation on its interior surfaces, if they don't evaporate by themselves, it can hopefully be redirected into that still flashing into the building exterior. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant correction, but I mean, it's just, it's sad that it had to happen in the first place just from one simple error and allowing, you know, all of the uh, conduction of uh, through directly through the, the metal here from the flashing up through the whole system to create that amount of condensation that this had to go through. So it's just amazing to me. We have a couple more examples here. Uh, the first one is a, a curtain wall system and a, a brick opening. Um, as you can see, the aluminum's pretty much tight to that brick. So there's no room for it a proper sealant joint between the materials. Um, really, they should have considered the different tolerances of the two different materials to ensure that there was a, a proper joint dimension there. And making sure, of course, that the, the framing is centered within the opening can also make a difference. Um, the bottom photo is some misalignment of some framing members. Uh, 
possibly a, a shear block issue here. And if the ends of these tubes are open, there's likely some air and water getting into portions of the system that there shouldn't be. This photo at the right, um, not quite sure what happened here. If, if the uh, setting blocks weren't provided when the rest of the, the components were when they were installing this window or if they just grabbed whatever they had, but the setting blocks obviously aren't correct here in multiple pieces and, and that could result in damage to the IGU itself or compatibility issues with whatever sealants were going in. Uh, it's just not a, a good situation. We call it creative field solutions, but it isn't always the best. It isn't always exactly. the best way to uh, to uh, solve things. Yeah. So, are these worker responsibilities or management responsibilities? Had a, a QMS a quality management management system been implemented, ideally, the the workers would be educated. Expectations would be clearly set, and uh, these things would be verified prior to uh, turning it over to the the owner. So does a glazing contractor with a quality management system offer owners, architects, and contractors an advantage? Of course, yes. Uh, here's an example where manufacturer installation instructions weren't followed. Uh, Anti-walk blocks were specified but weren't installed. So the glass wasn't properly located within the opening and uh, there was a direct open joint from interior to exterior. Here you can see a, a Canadian um, bill passing through that space. So you have free flow of air, free flow of water, um, which just is never a good situation. Um, oftentimes, I personally don't see installation instructions on site. Um, the foreman or installers say that they've done it dozens, hundreds of times before, so they don't need to follow the, those instructions. But um, those installation instructions are regularly updated. Uh, minor changes are made to systems or if you go from one manufacturer to another, they, there may be slight, slight tweaks to how things like um, joint plugs or other critical seals are installed to make sure that the systems are, are performing as designed. So verifications provide quality checks. What are verifications? Verification should be written confirmation that a task has been properly performed and how. Generally, we see checklists, but in addition to those checklists, it's helpful to have random sampling where someone can go back, select a random unit, and maybe even partially disassemble that system to ensure that the underlying critical seals and components are in place. It, it shouldn't just be counting how many pieces of glass were installed or, or measuring the linear foot or linear feet of a window system. And why? Because if it isn't in writing, there's no proof that it happened. And if they don't take that extra step to put it down into writing, we're not sure if they actually did those steps and, and verified what should be happening. Jeff, anything to add to that before I turn it back to you? No, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the random sampling is an extremely important piece. I mean, uh, many times, you know, there, there's a uh, you know, foreman goes through and may count the number of frames that were installed uh, or may, you know, just take a random walk to determine uh, what happened. But, but being able to, or, you know, how the how well the installation went, um, but to have a checklist and actually do some, uh, some random sampling through uh, disassembly, um, you catch things like gaskets that weren't cut the, wrong, the right way or end dams or zone dams that weren't put into the right place or flashing issues like we saw in the earlier example. So yeah, it's an extremely important, it's an extremely important piece of this. I think once you have, uh, once you, you, know, you do find a problem, then you can go back and dig in and figure out, uh, you know, if, if you test one out of every 10 frames through disassembly, you have one issue, you can go and do two more to make sure that, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just a one off or verify it wasn't just a one off. Uh, and then you can dig down more from there and determine if it's training issues or material issues or substitutions that occurred in the field or uh, you know, conditions in the field. There's all kinds of things that can happen, but it's, yeah, it's an extremely important piece. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, this, this is interesting. I really enjoy this, this book. It's, uh, 
It's the Checklist Manifesto, and uh, it was written by Atul Gawande. Atul is a, a general endocrine surgeon at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, it's, it's, you know, you may realize endocrine, endocrine surgery is uh, extremely intricate, uh, difficult to perform, and it can have uh, significant consequences if it doesn't if it isn't done right. Likewise, uh, you know, getting on a plane, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you know the right checks were done on a plane. So, I guess you know, the important thing from that comes from this book and from this example is the checklists have been used for generations for aviation. Uh, they're used for surgery. They're used for other important things that happen in our lives every day uh, for controls of the way things that are done. There's simply a way of creating this cognitive net uh, to prevent things that are forgotten or things that aren't, uh, you know, aren't trained properly. Checklists are intended to look at the right way of doing things and uh, having specific checks in certain areas to determine if they were done right. Uh, but it creates an attention to thoroughness. I think there's also a worker, a worker responsibility that comes with knowing that their work is going to be checked. It's kind of like taking a test that isn't graded. Are you going to work as hard as if you take a test that you know is graded and it's going to be scrutinized. So I think that you know it is important for many reasons to have checklists in place. Uh, it's an important piece of process control. There's a lot of benefits to using checklists and what we refer to as verifications or quality checks. It specifically tells the supervisor what to look for. Um, it's enforcing that important that quality is important. Some of this with quality systems, you're creating a culture. It's not just about, hey, we have a manual or we have checklists. Um, it's creating that culture that everybody on the team has a piece of, um, from the, the worker that's doing the installation to the manager that's inspecting the installation, whether it's a foreman or uh, you know, a shop supervisor. But, but it just says for that organization, hey, we focus on quality. We take the extra steps. We take the extra effort to make sure that things are done right. Uh, it forces workers to elevate their performance. It also catches a lot of those trouble spots that are, are maybe easier to overlook uh, or have happened in the past. Uh, looking at root causes and going back and saying, okay, we need to add that to our checklist so that we don't miss that again in the future. But it creates peace of mind for, uh, it creates peace of mind for everybody involved, the owner of the project, the general contractor, the architect, the glazing contractor, staff, uh, it creates peace of mind for everybody and ultimately for the occupants of the building later on. Uh, so it's an important, it's an important step in, in making sure that both buildings perform properly. So we're just going to look at a couple of examples of things that are commonly included on checklists. So would verification catch this? Uh, the checklist item, as we discussed earlier, it, it's usually short and sweet uh, to the point. The most important components should be on the checklist, it, easily understood. Um, our guess gets sized correctly, one quarter inch per foot greater than the DLO. So in this photo here, you can see that the gasket was cut short of the opening, uh, which will make it so that this system just doesn't perform as intended. You'll have some air leakage, possibly even water leakage with this. And if, if the checklist was in place and, and properly implemented, this is something that would have been caught. Some of the glazers don't like to take the extra effort to cut it, cut it longer and then try and stuff it in. And you get a mm -hmm. coat of worm juice and try and push it into the, and force it into the opening. And so it, it's not quite as easy as just a, a glass gasket's cut to exactly the length, but this is what happens with shrinkage over time. I mean, that, that's not, it's not exactly. a shrink. Say, over time, many gaskets will shrink. So yeah, having sure. them longer than, than the opening from the beginning is what's required. For sure. Uh, here's another one. Is insulation installed continuously with no gaps greater than one quarter inch? Uh, in this case, there was a, a joint between the insulation boards because of a stiffener in the spandrel region of a curtain wall. Uh, you can see they went back with some insulation stuffed in it to that joint, but it looks like they did it from the sides, maybe because that middle of the joint, there's still a, a pretty sizable gap there. I believe in this case, it was about an inch wide and that will affect the, the thermal performance, maybe not greatly, but it does have an effect. You can give a C minus because they did, they did show some intent to try and stuff some, some insulation in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So what's really important when doing verification is to determine the root cause of the issue. You want to know who, what, where, when, how, and why, uh, and really understand everything that happens so that you can try to avoid it in the future. To prevent quality issues, you want to quantify exactly what it means to have the issues, determine the root cause. Once you know what that root cause was, you can explore corrective actions. Uh, sometimes with different members of the team, different people might have different ideas. So it's, it's always great to have everyone involved in that exploration. And then you implement that change. And most importantly, I think, is to monitor the effectiveness. Um, sometimes it's an iterative process. You think something's going to work, but in reality, something slightly different may actually be better. So as, as you uh, go through a project, sometimes I see checklists and, and verification procedures updated many times, even through maybe even the last lot of materials. Yes, yeah, sir, with that slide, that had a couple, couple of extra tabs <laughs> on it. <laughs> All right, so determining the root cause. Uh, this is an example where maybe it isn't as straightforward as it initially may seem. So why did it happen? Not necessarily how. As you can see, the, uh, the screw through this pressure plate, the curtain wall system, isn't fully seated. It isn't tight to that pressure plate. What happened? The pressure bars weren't snug against the glass. How did it happen? The installers didn't tighten them enough. Well, in this case, they actually did tighten them as much as they could, but they were using the incorrect fasteners. The screws were too long to be able to properly compress that pressure bar against the glass. Um, so the only way to fix it would be to remove those screws and use the proper ones to get proper compression. So in all these examples, if we're looking at determining the root cause, there was a lack of well-defined operational procedure or verification process. Sometimes management is relying too heavily on what they think their people know and not enough on the defined processes. Management is sometimes focused on putting out fires without focusing on the business as a whole. And that may be because of lack of understanding about the benefits and implementation of AQMS. Yeah, some great examples, Dana, and uh, you know, it really shows why, you know, especially with those fasteners um, that had bottomed out, you know, it really, it really does require some root cause analysis because it's easy to just jump to a conclusion and you can say the glaze to go tighten them again and they tighten them again. And even if they're, even if they're checking the torque, they're going to seem like they're tight, um, right. but they're, they're bottoming out. So getting to the root cause of things is, uh, is many times, uh, you know, a, a very, uh, very valuable step. And you know, in all this too, it's it's really uh, it's really about trusting but verifying. Um, we trust that the glaziers are going to do what they're supposed to do or what they best understand they should be doing. But there has to be a verification by the by the glazing contractors as a whole through their quality management system. Beyond that, um, independent third party assessments and ind independent verification through certification is a game changer. If we're if we're to make a, a larger impact on the industry, it can't be just one contractor. It can't just be one step. Um, it requires certification and in, as a means of of uh, a checkup on on how you know how this is happening overall throughout the industry. So providing that through uh, certification programs, verifying that uh, you know there are quality systems in place and competent installers, safety programs that are in place, and other steps of this, this certification process but um, verifying that they, they have taken the extra steps to move beyond, hey, we have good people to, we have competent people, we have best practices in place, and we've identified uh, the way to implement those best practices through systems, processes, and procedures, uh, and you have much better possible outcomes on, on projects. Um, I'm going to pause again just for a second uh, before I talk about the, the two certification programs briefly uh, and see if we have any questions at this point. Uh, please, if you do have questions, uh, maybe we're explaining it so well you don't have questions, uh, I would hope, or, or we've uh, maybe bored you. But uh, if you do have questions, please type them into the uh, into the, the question box. And we're coming up to a point in just a couple minutes here where we'll be uh, taking some open questions and, and more so even uh, encouraging some open discussion. I'd love to know some feedback on 
on uh, you know what you think of how this is all how this is all occurring, uh, and maybe some of the effects uh, for you directly uh, as, as uh, an NFRC member. So the first, the first, and, and maybe you've heard about this already. Uh, this is the North American Contractor Certification Program, specifically for glazing contractors. This program uh, is designed to identify uh, through a program procedural guide uh, tables of requirements, best practices that should be implemented for a glazing contractor to have consistently. Uh, positive outcomes on glazing projects. Along with that, having competent and professional staff that are trained and verified, um, everything from the people doing the job drawings to the estimators to the project managers, but specifically those that are going to be the last ones touching the product going in, uh, trained and verified installers or glazers. Uh, and so the NACC concept to drive this for the industry through an ANSI accredited certification program. The, the makeup of the program is uh, this is done through independent third party assessments. Um, there's a 32 page 50 category checklist and some of the things that are covered in that checklist are business practices. Business practices looking at simple things like are they a legitimate business? Do they have the proper insurance? coverages? Do they have the infrastructure and, and uh, rack trucks and glass trucks and lift equipment and things that they need to have in place for the types of projects that they're taking on? Do they have the, uh, do they have the bonding capacity for the types of projects that they're bidding on? Do they have competent staff in place? Safety, do they have a written safety program? Much in the way we talked about having written processes and procedures for quality, safety is very similar. And processes and procedures for dealing with safety, uh, policies in place for safety, everything from cell phone use to you know drug analysis, what is done to make sure that before you have people going up onto the 30th store of the building and hanging out uh, on the outside, you know, what what are they doing for safety stuff? Contract administrative processes. This is estimating and project management and evaluation of how those are carried out within the organization, which includes everything from how a job is estimated to make sure that it's going to meet contract specific requirements and specifications, um, to how jobs are handed off from the estimator to project management to the field in order to execute those projects. Quality, we dove into uh, quality systems. This is by far the biggest hurdle for glazing contractors to become certified is uh, implementing these quality systems. It takes time, effort, and maintenance in order to have a quality system that is fully implemented, operational, and effective. Uh, and then finally, glazing processes. This is looking what happens in the field. Um, how are those verification steps uh, and checklists handled in the field? Are manufacturers installation instructions handled in the field properly? And, uh, verify to make sure that they're the current revisions of the manufacturer's installation instructions um, or special installation instructions if it's a unique job. Uh, and then how are materials preserved, how are tools calibrated, all the things that go into successful outcomes on glazing projects are checked through this uh, through this process. It's done, it's done uh, as a multi-day audit uh, every year, so it's an annual annual exam basically. Uh, it's at the primary facility for the uh, for the glazing contractor, looking at their office operations, their shop operations, and then going on to job sites to see how uh, things are carried out on job sites as well. There's uh, 20 mandatory items and then 30 items that are scored. Uh, I think the scored items, we took the advantage there to say, okay, we're going to score some of these items, but moving from year to year, you've got to show improvement, so it drives that continuous improvement. So if they get a if you get at least one point, there's a three point scale. If you get at least one point to show intent to comply. And then from there, they have to grow and uh, improve from year to year uh, to drive towards full, you know, full compliance and, uh, and effectiveness of the, each requirement. The other piece of this is uh, personnel certification. As I mentioned earlier on in this presentation, there really has not been a standard in place for glazers. Um, so in 2019, the AGMT, Architectural Glass and Metal Technician Certification Program was rolled out. I think it would have been a lot easier if we just called it the glazer certification, but um, the formal, the formal uh, definition of a glazer is Architectural Glass and Metal Technician. Uh, so the AGMT uh, program was, was uh, born. Uh, to date, we have uh, 
15, a little over 1,500 glazers that have become certified uh, across the U.S. and uh, as well as in Canada. And uh, what certification means is that they have to go through a rigorous evaluation, which includes a written test, uh, 125 question written test, which takes two hours. Um, we actually test 135 questions because we, we have to do some beta testing of future questions. So everything is vetted before it's used in the, in the program. Then they move on to physical tests. Um, and, and this generally takes a full day to go through uh, as a test. There's a lot of test fatigue going through it for a glazer, but they have to do a physical installation of a curtain wall unit. Uh, and we have these test rigs. Uh, I think we have around 27 of them now that are shipped all over the country for this. Uh, and we set up these test rigs. We have a professional exam team that goes in. And uh, so they have to install up on the left. They have to go through a, a uh, span of, of curtain wall to, uh, to go through that installation. Um, they have to don a harness just like they would in the field before they start the installation. Um, they have to go through a layout test to make sure that they can handle the, uh, the construction math and fractions and so forth that's required to get uh, you know, from the benchmark to the right position to install it, get a palm level square and so forth. They also have to go through a storefront installation, uh, which includes this 3070 door along with the side light. Uh, and the interesting thing is we, we put in a knee wall condition uh, and the, the feedback from the industry is if you use a knee wall, you're gonna know if they understand flashing and how to install flashing uh, and get the threshold right and so forth. So um, using this knee wall condition, they, but they have to go through this installation, uh, install and adjust the closer. And then uh, from, from there, they also do a weather ceiling, which I don't have a picture of on here, a weather ceiling, uh, which includes dealing with things like paper joints, um, working around angles, uh, but getting everything tooled correctly, working with the perimeter joint in order to make sure that uh, they understand how to correctly install sealant with a continuous flow, tool the sealant, and most importantly, get that uh, two to one ratio that's required to allow elasticity in the sealant uh, once it's installed uh, against the backer rod. They also have to do a structural sealing uh, to verify that they have the ability to install structural sealing uh, for structural glazing projects, uh, verifying there's no bubbles, no air gaps, it's uh, you know, continuous coverage and so forth for the structural ceiling. Everything is then graded. Um, we use a psychometric uh, evaluation process, which uh, grades, we, we go through grading at specific points uh, and verify that the entire installation has been done correctly. Uh, and then they, they receive a pass or fail. Uh, they have to go through a recertification every four years, uh, which includes a written test again. So, yep, we can go to the next one. And uh, we are making inroads into the into the uh, the glazing industry and the entire construction industry. This has been included into master spec. Uh, so we're in installer qualifications under quality assurance and master spec for products or project specifications. Uh, it does include language now to require certifications, both NACC and uh, AGMT, in order to verify that they are uh, they are competent. And, and really, what this has done is it has removed a lot of subjective criteria. Uh, an installer qualification that says five years in the business um, or trained and approved by the manufacturer doesn't necessarily create a benchmark. Um, or a, a threshold that can be measured. So having a qualification, which is an ANSI accredited certification is a way to make sure that, uh, that this is adhered to for, uh, for the glazing portions of projects. Um, we track the Dodge report in order to determine how, uh, how the growth of the, uh, the specifications are occurring. And currently uh, there's uh, a little over a thousand projects currently uh, in process right now. Uh, in the U.S. that come up on the Dodge report with uh, the NACC and AGMT requirements and the specs. Um, and the Dodge report doesn't capture everything. It's not going to capture the, uh, it's not going to capture a lot of the, the private business that's being done, um, but it'll capture most of the public work that's being done on the country or larger projects. So we know the number's even bigger. So it's just, you know, I guess we, we led to this point where we said, okay, we're gonna have some questions and, and maybe more importantly thoughts. I know we're coming up 159. Um, that's the end of the presentation portion, but we'd ask for you if you're willing to, to stick around and give us uh, some questions or some thoughts. Um, I do wanna emphasize this, this whole 
certification program um, is an open industry program. Uh, Dana Landis from West Janie Elster, who's on the call here with me, uh, is is a uh, a member of our board. Uh, we have an 18 member board um, of independent industry individuals. Um, it's a split board of 50% for the installation community, which includes glazing contractors and glazers, and then 50% from the uh, the industry, which includes uh, Turner Construction, as an example, for general contractors, skid mowings, mineral architects, uh, with Janie Elsner, uh, CDC, uh, Kerbal Design Consulting. Uh, Morris and Hirschfield, uh, Guardian Glass, CRL, uh, Dow Sealants. So it's a, it's a very you know, good cross section of industry supporting this as well. And because it's an industry open open program, um, you know, similar to to uh, NFRC and the participation of members of NFRC, uh, we do welcome any uh, any support or, or any uh, participation in these from NFRC members or manufacturers. Uh, or uh, you know other stakeholders that may be on this call as well. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, give us your thoughts as well, and uh, our email address is up there. But let's do that. Let's go to some some questions and thoughts. Can we uh, can we go to unmute Robin? I know it might be just a second as we do that. Uh, moving to unmute. Uh, yeah, if um, somebody has a comment and you'd like to raise your hand, I can unmute you. While they're doing that, uh, Tom, do you have any thoughts after sitting through this? I know you, know you and I have talked in the past, and hopefully we hit the mark today of what you're hoping to cover here. Um, but from an NFRC standpoint, um, can you see some some benefit from from this entire process? Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. That was a, an excellent presentation and some invaluable information. I, I'm sure you sparked a lot of new ideas among the audience for sure. I thought it was just especially interesting just the the idea of certification and the the process based outcomes you know we've all seen those kinds of situations where we've known a person for a long time and we've uh, come to trust them they have a lot of credibility with us but uh, nothing is better than following best practices and I think that was a really important theme that that you really called out here today good I'm glad we were able to do that and, uh, you know I think I think extremely importantly is Dana with some of the examples and everything going through it. It's one thing to talk about concepts, but when you can see how those concepts are applied in the field uh, and then hear those stories, I mean Dana's out there evaluating things on a regular basis and you know as part of her job and trying to, to uncover why issues occur. So invaluable to have her on this call as well. Yeah, I, I think that was great. And uh, if we don't have any questions for the moment, I'm sure that uh, folks will reach out to you, take you up on your invitation and uh, maybe contact you later. It's uh, certainly a lot of great information. It might uh, take some time to kind of process and take it all in. And I'm sure some questions will, will emerge from that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, if, you can, if you can just email me if you have questions or uh, you can connect to me. I think I'm the only Jeff Dallab on, on LinkedIn. Uh, so. You certainly can uh, connect with me on, on LinkedIn as well, um, but I'd be thrilled to, uh, to interact with you uh, and, and uh, you know, figure out how we can how we can work together. And I think that the important thing here is this isn't this isn't just a uh, you know one one person movement or just a small movement. This is the industry moving forward to become better. Um, the same way that NFRC has made the industry better by evaluating the way that uh, you know the way that buildings are going to perform based on products that are installed in them this is a movement as well that's going to determine how the industry can perform better through the installation process to make sure that those requirements that are set forth by nfrc are carried out uh and and uh, you know the building is going to perform i think one of the interesting things is i hear some of the the stories of the, the infrastructure bills and the the new uh bills that are being put brought forth uh, by the current administration is there's going to be more focus on on verifying performance. Um, so it's one thing to say a building is going to perform this way, but there's going to be a lot more focus on verifying that performance in order to get tax tax credits and so forth. So uh, I think that uh, you know we all have to work together, and uh, you know they're all valuable pieces and important pieces of the puzzle. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think, think that's so. a great takeaway. Sorry, Dana, please. That's all right. I was just going to say, please also feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email. I think. Uh, the overall goal of these programs are to really have certifications that mean something. Um, 
we worked really hard to, to try to develop them in a way that uh, architects and owners can really trust that they're getting something from these certifications. And we're, as Jeff said, we're always looking for more input from anybody in the industry who may have ideas on how to make that even better. Well, that's great. I just want to thank you again as we wrap up for this rare and unique opportunity to tap into your expertise. And uh, we'll keep everyone updated about future installments of our emerging technology and sustainability series. And we hope to see everyone again soon. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for attending and thank you for uh, being part of this.